The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain Chapter 23 Well, all day him and the king was hard at it, rigging up a stage and a curtain and a row of candles for footlights, and that night the house was jam full of men in no time. When the place couldn't hold no more, the duke he quit tendin' door and went around the back way and come on to the stage and stood up before the curtain and made a little speech and praised up this tragedy and said it was the most thrillingest one that ever was. And so he went on a bragging about the tragedy and about Edmund Cain the Elder, which was to play the main principal part in it, and at last when he got everybody's expectations up high enough, he rolled up the curtain, and the next minute the king come a-prancing out on all fours, naked, and he was painted all over, ring streaked and striped, all sorts of colors as splendid as a rainbow. And, but never mind the rest of his outfit, it was just wild, but it was awful funny. The people most killed themselves laughing, and when the king got done capering and capered off behind the scenes, they roared and clapped and stormed and haw-hawed till he come out and done it over again, and after that they made him do it another time. Well, it would make a cow laugh to see the shines that old idiot cut. Then the duke he lets the curtain down and bows to the people and says the great tragedy will be performed only two nights more on account of pressing London engagements where the seats is all sold already for it in Drury Lane, and then he makes them another bow, and says if he has succeeded in pleasing them and instructing them, he will be deeply obliged if they will mention it to their friends and get them to come and see it. Twenty people sings out, What? Is it over? Is that all? The Duke says yes. Then there was a fine time. Everybody sings out, Sold, and rose up mad, and was going for that stage and them tragedians. But a big, fine-looking man jumps up on a bench and shouts, Hold on, just a word, gentlemen. They stop to listen. We are sold, mighty badly sold, but we don't want to be the laughing stock of this whole town, I reckon, and never hear the last of this thing as long as we live. No. What we want is to go out of here quiet and talk this show up and sell the rest of the town. Then we'll all be in the same boat. Ain't that sensible? You bet it is. The judge is right. Everybody sings out. All right, then. Not a word about any sell. Go along home and advise everybody to come and see the tragedy. Next day you couldn't hear nothing around that town but... How splendid that show was! House was jammed again that night, and we sold this crowd the same way. When me and the king and the duke got home to the raft, we all had a supper, and by and by, about midnight, they made Jim and me back her out and float her down the middle of the river, and fetch her in and hide her about two mile below town. The third night the house was crammed again, and they weren't newcomers this time, but people that was at the show the other two nights. I stood by the duke at the door, and I see that every man that went in had his pockets bulging, or something muffled up under his coat, and I see it wa not no perfumery neither, not by a long sight. I smelt sickly eggs by the barrel, and rotten cabbages and such things, and if I know the signs of a dead cat being around, and I bet I do, there was sixty-four of them went in. I shoved in there for a minute, but it was too various for me. I couldn't stand it. Well, when the place couldn't hold no more people, the duke he give a fellow a quarter and told him to tend door for him a minute, and then he started around for the stage door, I after him. But the minute we turned the corner and was in the dark, he says, Walk fast now, till you get away from the houses, and then shin for the raft like the dickens was after you. I done it, and he done the same. We struck the raft at the same time, and in less than two seconds we was gliding downstream, all dark and still, 
and edging towards the middle of the river, nobody saying a word. I reckon the poor king was in for a gaudy time of it with the audience, but nothing of the sort. Pretty soon he crawls out from under the wigwam and says, Well, how'd the old thing pan out this time, Duke? He hadn't been uptown at all. We never showed a light till we was about ten mile below the village. Then we lit up and had a supper, and the king and the duke fairly laughed their bones loose over the way they'd serve them people. The duke says, Greenhorns, flatheads, I knew the first house would keep mum and let the rest of the town get roped in, and I knew they'd lay for us the third night and consider it was their turn now. Well, it is their turn, and I'd give something to know how much they'd take for it. I would just like to know how they're putting in their opportunity. They can turn it into a picnic if they want to. They brought plenty provisions. Them rapscallions took in four hundred and sixty-five dollars in that three nights. I never see money hauled in by the wagon load like that before. By and by, when they was asleep and snoring, Jim says, "'Don't it surprise you the way dem kings carries on, Huck?' "'No,' I says. "'It don't.' "'Why don't it, Huck?' "'Well, it don't, because it's in the breed. I reckon they're all alike.' "'But, Huck, these kings are and as regular rapscallions. Does just what they is. They's regular rapscallions.' "'Well, that's what I'm a-sayin'. All kings is mostly rapscallions, as fur as I can make out. Is that so? You read about them once, you'll see. Look at Henry the Eighth. This is a Sunday school superintendent to him. And look at Charles Second, and Louis Fourteen, and Louis Fifteen, and James Second, and Edward Second, and Richard Third, and forty more besides all them Saxon heptarchies that used to rip around so in old times and raise Cain. My, you ought to seen old Henry the Eight when he was in bloom. He was a blossom. He used to marry a new wife every day and chop off her head next morning, and he would do it just as indifferent as if he were ordering up eggs. Fetch up Nell Gwyn, he says. They fetch her up. Next morning chop off her head, and they chop it off. Fetch up Jane Shore, he says, and up she comes. Next morning, chop off her head, and they chop it off. Ring up Fair Rosamoon. Fair Rosamoon answers the bell. Next morning, chop off her head, and he made every one of them tell a tale every night, and he kept that up till he had hogged a thousand and one tales that way. And then he put them all in a book, and called it Domesday Book, which was a good name and stated the case. You don't know kings, Jim, but I know them, and this old rip of iron is one of the cleanest I've struck in history. Well, Henry, he takes a notion he wants to get up some trouble with his country. How does he go at it? Give notice? Give the country a show? No! All of a sudden he heaves all the tea in Boston Harbor overboard and whacks out a declaration of independence and dares them to come on. That was his style. He never give anybody a chance. He had suspicions of his father, the Duke of Wellington. Well, what did he do? Ask him to show up? No. Drowned him in a butt of mamsey, like a cat. Suppose people left money laying around where he was. What did he do? He collared it. Suppose he contracted to do a thing, and you paid him, and didn't sit down there and see that he done it. What did he do? He always done the other thing. Suppose he opened his mouth. What then? If he didn't shut it up powerful quick, he'd lose a lie every time. That's the kind of a bug Henry was. And if we'd a had him along instead of our kings, he'd have fooled that town a heap worse than ours done. I don't say that ourn is lambs, because they ain't when you come right down to the cold facts, but they ain't nothing to that old ram anyway. All I say is, kings is kings, 
and you got to make allowances. Take them all around, they're a mighty ornery lot. It's the way they're raised. But this one do smell so like the nation, Huck. Well, they all do, Jim. We can't help the way a king smells. History don't tell no way. Now the Duke, he's a tolerable likely man in some ways. Yes, a Duke's different, but not very different. This one's a middlin' hard lot for a Duke. When he's drunk, there ain't no nearsighted man could tell him from a king. Well, anyways, I don't hanker for no more of em, Huck. These is all I can stand. It's the way I feel, too, Jim. But we've got them on our hands, and we got to remember what they are and make allowances. Sometimes I wish I could hear of a country that's out of kings. What was the use to tell Jim these weren't real kings and dukes? It wouldn't have done no good. And besides, it was just as I said. You couldn't tell them from the real kind. I went to sleep, and Jim didn't call me when it was my turn. He often done that. When I waked up just at daybreak, he was sitting there with his head down betwixt his knees, moaning and mourning to himself. I didn't take notice nor let on. I knowed what it was about. He was thinking about his wife and his children, away up yonder. He was low and homesick because he had never been away from home before in his life. And I do believe he cared just as much for his people as white folks does for theirn. It don't seem natural, but I reckon it's so. He was often moaning and mourning that way nights, when he judged I was asleep, and saying, Poor little Lisbeth, poor little Johnny, it's mighty hard. I expect I ain't ever going to see you no more, no more. He was a mighty good nigger, Jib was. But this time I somehow got to talking to him about his wife and young ones, and by and by he says, What makes me feel so bad this time is because I hear something over yonder on the bank like a whack or a slam while ago. And it mind me of the time I treat my little Lisbeth so ornery. She warn't only about four year old, and she took the scarlet fever and had a powerful rough spell, but she got well. And one day she was a standin' around, and I says to her, I says, "Shut the door." She never done it; just stood there, kind of smilin' up at me. It make me mad. And I says again, mighty loud, I says, Don't you hear me? Shut the door. She just stood the same way, kind of smiling up. I was a boiling. I says, I lay I make you mine. And with that, I fetch her a slap side the head that sought her a sprawling. Then I went into the other room and is gone about ten minutes. And when I come back, there was that door a standin' open yet, and that child standin' most right in it, a lookin' down and mournin', and the tears runnin' down. My, but I was mad. I was a goin' for the child, but just then, it was a door that opened in its. Just then, long come the wind and slams it too, behind the child, kerblam. In my land, the child never move. My breath most hop out of me, and I feel so, so, I don't know how I feel. I crope out all a trembling, and crope around and open the door easy and slow, and poke my head in behind the child, soft and still. And all of a sudden, I says, pow, just as loud as I could yell. She never budge. Oh, Huck, I bust out a crying and grab her up in my arms and say, Oh, the poor little thing, the Lord God Almighty forgive poor old Jim, cause he's never gonna forgive himself as long as he's alive. Oh, she was plumb deef and dumb, Huck, plumb deef and dumb, and I've been a treatin' her so. End of chapter.